The Chronological Achievements of Harriet Jane Hanson Robinson. I'm not. What are you even doing? Reading about the life of Harriet Jane Hanson Robinson. It's fascinating. Ow! She's incredible. She did so much that impacted our rights and responsibilities as women and workers today. History? It's not really my strong point. I'm more into art. Uh, okay, I'll admit that the textbook makes our history kind of dull, but it's not like that. I swear, history is full of action and exciting lessons. These not only help us comprehend how our world came to be today, the way it is today, but it also teaches us how we can impact and guide the future towards success. Let me just tell you about her, and if you don't enjoy yourself, I promise you can have my dessert for tonight. Deal? No headphones. Fine. Childhood. The Great Adventure started in Boston, August 2nd, 1825. Harriet Hansen was born to William and Harriet Hansen. Unfortunately, when little Harriet was only six years of age, her mother was widowed at the age of 36 and left with the full responsibility of four children. They opened up a small grocery store with one small room in the back where they lived and were forced to sleep together in a small, uncomfortable bed. Though it was meant to help them squeeze out a profit that they would manage to live on, the little shop had only thrown them deeper into debt. Despite all their troubles, Harriet's mother was determined to keep her children in school. Mill Life Soon Harriet's aunt had offered her mom a job as a housekeeper for the Lowell Mills boarding houses where she, as well as her family, would be housed and fed. Of course, Harriet Sr. simply could not resist and accepted the job. In 1831, her family moved to Lowell. Her mother's job had paid well, and the family's financial debt was slowly fading, but they were still poor. Harriet was eager to do anything she could to help her family. At the young age of 10, Harriet became a bobbin doffer, replacing full bobbins with empty ones. Harriet rejoiced at the honor of signing her name up for payroll and receiving her first paycheck. Later, Harriet was commissioned as the drawing-in girl, this was the most desired position of the whole mill. The task was only to lace thread through the loops and hooks of the machines. The job included a considerable pay, which she would always willingly and proudly handle over in full amount to her mother. Harriet had remembered her childhood as a pleasant time, her only trouble ha being having to wake up at the crack of dawn. Harriet had expressed that she believed the work was good for children and taught their fingers to be nimble and their feet to be able to fly swiftly. She told how the overseers were kind to the women and did not rush them, allowing them to work at their own pace. Some overseers would even allow the children to run and play out in the courtyard during times when their service was not required. She had claimed, as well, that her new job did not pay by the hour, allowing her to read while she worked. Harriet had a strong passion for books. She borrowed library books from one of her mother's fellow boarding mothers in exchange for Harriet to transport them to and from the library. She was the kind of child who would rather sit quietly in a nook under a shady tree and dip into a good book rather than run and play. Even though Harriet had found her experiences enjoyable, the mills began to decrease pay while increasing the work hours. This enraged the mill women and caused several rebellious strikes to break out, which she gladly took part in. Although she appreciated the opportunity to work and earn a living for her family all by herself, she also longed to learn. Education was still essential to her, and she studied evening classes and attended mill lectures spoken by college professors. Harriet was obviously not the only one who had a burning passion to learn. Professors had said that such detailed note-taking and tantalized eyes were even more studious than those who attended their classes in school. A Harvard professor had described that they had a passion and an effort that had surpassed even his most determined students. At age 13, Harriet decided to leave the mills to attend Lowell High School. That's where she stayed contently for two years. She'd even taken out chunks of her own life savings to pay for extra private lessons. 
After returning to the mills, Harriet joined one of the many Lowell writing and literature groups. She developed a strong passion for writing and poetry, as well as she had with reading novels. As a result, some of her early work had been published in the Lowell Offering. This was a magazine created by and for the mill girls. After the Mills After she had left the mills for good, she met her husband, William Stevens Robinson. He was a journalist whose primary focus of writing were anti-slavery articles. This had led him to use the fake pen name, Warrington. She had met him while taking some of her latest poetry pieces to be published in the Lowell Journal. They got married in 1848. Together, they later founded the Free Soil Party. Her husband's political belief of women's rights and anti-slavery formed her own. He would often read aloud to her. They expanded their family with four sparkling children, one of which unfortunately died during infancy. Harriet's and William's first house together, where the National Women's Suffrage Association had been formed, was later appreciated as a landmark in 1978. Six. William died in 1876, and the next year, in his honor, Harriet published a large collection of her husband's work. Starting at age 51, she worked as a sales agent to sell his books, and continued to write children's books on the sideline to support herself. At age 73, she wrote Loom and Spindle, a detailed novel exposing her experiences in the mills. It proudly described her participation in the Lowell strikes and complained about the schedule of her day. In one of her books, she had divulged that she and her husband had been in involved in the Centennial Tea Party in Boston, 1873. Harriet as a Suffragist Finally, she decided to become a woman suffragist. She decided that after her husband's death, she was able to devote much more time to women's rights activities. In 1876, Harriet had organized several women's rights conventions in Malden, Melrose, and Concord. She wrote about women's efforts and even composed two plays. In 1881, she wrote the nonfiction composition titled Massachusetts in the Women's Suffrage Movement. In this book, she displayed her strong support and effective actions that she had carried out as a contribution as an activist. She had illustrated how they had applied the motto, Taxation without representation is tyranny for women's rights. When the National Women's Suffrage Association formed in 1882, Harriet made the decision to join. Her daughter, Hattie, hastily followed her with the same settlement. They would both turn out to be very involved. This association fought for women's suffrage as well as working in family rights. Harriet had come to be the first woman to speak before the Select Committee on Women's Suffrage in Congress and had spoken for legislature of her state. She and her daughter had participated in the debate on women's suffrage in the U.S. Senate. Together, they had even founded a club addressed as the Old and New in Malden. She had taken part in the formation of the General Federation of Women's Clubs in 1890 and, as a result, was one of the first members on its advisory board. She had also become a member of the N.E. History Genealogical Society. What else? Harriet was often invited to come and give lectures of life as an early mill girl. She had grieved at the word that wages were being lowered, and conditions, including the ones that jeopardized the worker's safety, were worsened. Last Years of Life During her last years of life, Harriet had settled down more. In the last stage of her life, she was, once again, constantly reading. She wrote some, too, and progressed in her fondness of sewing. She chose to stay at home, surrounded by family. This is also how she died on December 22, 1911, at the wise age of 86. After her death, in the mills, competition was picking up with Britain. Workers were treated like machines as they were pushed harder than any human body could withstand. Wages had dropped dramatically, though the quality of the mills had diminished and the hours had been pushed up to 10 per day. By the mid to late 1800s, the mill girls had had enough and were replaced by des desperate immigrants. The wage cuts and conditions continued to worsen. The houses were cramped past the maximum limit at nearly 150 people living under the same roof. The working and living surroundings were polluted with filth. Atrocious air circulation was barely breathable. The mills were contaminated with several life-threatening diseases. 
At this point, it would be rare for you to survive past the term of 10 years in the mills, meaning most workers would pass before the age of 30. Soon, the Lowell Textile Mills would fade into history. Though the mills had seemed almost evil in the end, they had greatly increased the respect people felt towards women who chose to prove their responsibility. Obviously, the passion which Americans had exerted for this cause had affected the government. The progression towards women's rights laws were set in motion. Women st were starting to gain more public respect as equal citizens. Finally, women's suffrage was passed only nine years after Harriet's death in 1920. This cascaded into a whole new series of women's rights movements, from Rosie the Riveter to its inclusion in the right Civil Rights Act of 1964 to the women's rights movement of 1960 through 1970 to now. We still stand, fighting for women's rights from the beginning to the end. Now I see what you're saying. That was amazing. She truly was a hero. I mean, if it weren't for her or people like her, would politicians still believe that we didn't even deserve the same rights as men? Would they not even consider us enough of a citizen vote because of our gender? So many of the amazing inventions we take for granted today are because of the innovative ideas and creativity of women. Our nation would never have been so free if we hadn't had the motivation to evaluate our rights with men's. Ridiculous. If not for her and similar heroines taking on the responsibility to represent women and stand up for our rights by protesting and assembling, our country would have been a much darker place for women. Harriet, though she might not have known at the time, had worked with determination and persistency to prove that we could handle the responsibility to maintain jobs and overcome tough challenges so that we could be granted with the right to work. And though our cause might have more so promoted the rights and proved the capability of women, men all over the nation could also be inspired by the dedication of the sweet little impoverished country girl who stood strong-willed in our fight for her rights. It shows that equality is essential for our nation, with proof of how far we've come, but only with the knowledge of women. Even today we struggle for equality, and women much like Harriet continue to fight for their rights. And I know that women's suffrage was not internationally granted. In several Middle Eastern countries, women continue to be cruelly looked down upon. I mean, this is why we need to spread the word about equality, just like Harriet. I mean, Harriet's a wonderful and awe-inspiring woman who should be looked up to for centuries. It's like I get my ice cream. Ugh, whatever. Come on, it's almost time for dinner.